Welcome to our corner of understanding and compassion, where we delve into the complexities of relationships and nurture bonds that last a lifetime. Hello, I hail from Brooklyn and I'm in my mid-50s. As I put pen to paper to share my tale, tears trickle down, reflecting upon the chapters of my life that have already been written. My parents departed from my life too soon, leaving me to find solace in a countryside orphanage affiliated with a Catholic church. The nuns there became my guardians. There were countless dreams I harbored and skills I yearned to learn. I often found myself green with envy seeing my peers, who had the privilege of parents, pursue extracurricular studies, be it academic or artistic. Recognizing my fervor for learning, one of the nuns, Sister Aria, approached me. Brooklyn, she said gently, focus on the present. Is there something you wish to pursue here, without the constraint of funds? I'd love to delve into the art of cooking, sister. The idea of creating savory roasts, stews, and even baking fresh bread excites me, I responded. Nodding, she made arrangements with the head of the kitchen to initiate my culinary journey. As a youngster, my tasks were limited to washing produce and observing. But, those observational years equipped me with the know-how of crafting various dishes. By the time I reached middle school, the kitchen welcomed me with open arms, letting me wield knives and work with the gas stove. My skills in baking and cookie making were commendable, but my heart truly resonated with the flavors of Asian cuisine. Brooklyn had tastes different from typical youngsters of her age. While most children would lean towards baking cookies or crafting delicate pastries, Brooklyn's heart lay with Asian cuisine. Perhaps you should consider becoming a certified Asian chef, maybe even run your own restaurant, Sister Aria had once told her. Those words anchored deeply within her. From that point, Brooklyn's aspirations were set, she was determined to become a certified Asian chef. Throughout her middle school and high school years, that goal remained unshaken. Even though academia wasn't her strong suit, and she lacked the familial support many took for granted, this culinary path was one she believed she could tread. By the age of 18, as she prepared to leave the orphanage, she was officially certified as an Asian cuisine chef by a renowned culinary institute. With Sister Aria's recommendation, Brooklyn found herself at a quaint restaurant, run by a gracious elderly lady, who generously offered her the little room adjoining the eatery for a year. Sister Aria explained, while there are housing facilities in larger establishments, you wish to master Asian cuisine. It makes more sense for you to live with this kind-hearted woman. You'll thrive there, Sister Aria assured, hugging Brooklyn for the last time. She revealed that the elderly restaurant owner was a fellow churchgoer and had faced her share of life's tragedies, having lost her son in an unfortunate accident a decade earlier. Perhaps that's why the woman showered Brooklyn with unparalleled warmth. Generously, the restaurant owner would pack Brooklyn two meals each day for school. Grandma, you don't have to do this. Just letting me stay here without charging rent is a blessing, Brooklyn would often say. But the owner would simply reply, it's no bother to pack an extra meal. It's not as if I'm giving away a room in my home. I'll always assist where I can, so please don't feel indebted, she'd say. Having grown up without parents myself, I understand your journey. So please, accept my help. Gratefully, I'd respond, thank you for your unwavering support. I managed to graduate high school seamlessly, then secured a job in a corporate cafeteria. Grandma, I told her, thanks to your generosity, I graduated and landed this job. I promise to visit frequently. Please stay well. She'd chuckle, you earned that job on your merit. What did I have to do with it? Just ensure you immerse yourself in your new role, and don't stress about visiting too often. Starting off, I handled basic chores in the kitchen like washing dishes and cleaning. But earning my own money and living independently was a rewarding experience. Without being prompted, I'd venture out to clear tables or handle tasks others avoided, like taking out the trash. One day, one of the senior chefs approached me. 
She shared that the company president's wife and other executive wives volunteered monthly, distributing food to the homeless. Because of her advancing age, she needed assistance with meal preparations and asked if I could help. Given it was a once-a-month commitment, and considering my relatively free weekends, apart from occasional visits to the orphanage or grandma, I eagerly agreed. From that point onward, my weekends became dedicated to assisting with the food distribution for the homeless. I was responsible for warming up dishes, packaging, and sometimes cooking directly at the location. Initially, I committed to a year, but the work resonated so deeply that I continued for over three years. It was during this period that I got acquainted with the president's wife. One day, she approached me, Brooklyn, I'm hosting a small gathering at my home next week. Would you be willing to assist? It won't be too demanding, you'd primarily be working alongside my housekeeper. And of course, you'll be compensated. Grateful for the opportunity to earn extra, I readily accepted. The dinner was in honor of patrons who supported her volunteer organization. However, one guest, a fellow Brooklynite, seemed particularly intrigued by my culinary skills. When can we meet again? I'd love for you to cook for me, she proposed. Hesitant, I mentioned my regular job, but she persisted, suggesting an arrangement after my work hours and offering generous compensation. Intrigued, I agreed to meet her later. To my surprise, our next rendezvous included a gentleman and his mother. I thought you two might hit it off, but I was concerned you might decline the meat, the woman explained. I vouch for them wholeheartedly, she added. Being an orphan, meeting new people, especially in such personal settings, often made me apprehensive. However, the gentleman and his mother exuded warmth, making me feel at ease. Alone for so long. I couldn't help but fantasize about the prospect of finding a family in them. One day, out of the blue, he proposed. Brooklyn, I genuinely believe our lives together would be filled with joy and laughter. Would you consider being my life partner? I promise to care for you. Hesitant, I asked, are you sure about someone like me? He confidently replied, if I had reservations about us, would I have pursued this relationship? Taking solace in his words, I agreed. On our wedding day, the restaurant owner, the grandmotherly figure who had been a pillar in my life, was given pride of place. As we prepared to leave for our honeymoon, she grasped my hand, whenever life gets tough, know that you have a home with me. Tearfully, I replied, I'll visit even when times are good. But life had other plans. After the honeymoon, instead of returning to the bustling city I was familiar with, we found ourselves in a quaint countryside town. Samuel, I queried, I thought our home was in the city. He replied, I never specified where. We have a restaurant here, and my mother believes it could use your expertise. Before I could even settle in our new home, Samuel ushered me to the restaurant. It was spacious but lacked patrons. His mother promptly directed, head to the kitchen, tidy up, and start working. Taken aback, I responded, we've just arrived. Shouldn't we get some rest first? She retorted, this is our family's restaurant. We need your skills in the kitchen. Ever since our previous chef left, things haven't been the same. Why are you dawdling, she demanded, ushering me into the kitchen. That day, under my mother-in-law's stern supervision, I toiled away tirelessly. I hoped to get some clarity from Samuel later, but by the time I got home, he was deep in slumber. The next morning, before Samuel had even stirred, his mother summoned me. Why aren't you in the kitchen already? Fetch the ingredients, prepare them, there's no time for idling. I thought better of you, but it seems you're looking for ways to avoid work. Without pause to even protest, I was set to task. Samuel was nowhere in sight. By mid-afternoon, I finally found a moment's respite. I sought answers from my mother-in-law. Did Samuel not mention the restaurant's troubles? We're sinking, and with your qualifications and skill in the kitchen, you might just be our lifeline. 
Exhausted, I responded, a heads up would have been nice, especially right off the back of our honeymoon. Also, what about my wages? She looked taken aback, considering your upbringing, I expected a little less, calculation. We're family now. A family collaborates for a brighter future, not for monetary gain. We should be unified, not bickering about compensation. I was moved by her emphasis on family unity. It felt like my lifelong yearning for a family was finally being realized. As the days went on, my mother-in-law grew increasingly colder, while my husband's behavior shifted drastically from the man I thought I knew. I often found myself waking up while he was still asleep, and by the time I'd return home after a long day, he'd be lost in slumber once again. On the rare occasions when he did stay out later than me, he'd return inebriated. You think you're better than me now? He'd slur in his drunken stupor. Without me, who'd have looked twice at an orphan like you? I'm your saving grace. He'd then collapse into a deep sleep. Each day, my mother-in-law would bark orders at me. At times, I'd ponder over how my role in the restaurant differed from other employees. The glaring difference, of course, was that they received a salary for their efforts while I did not. Her harsh words became a constant, questioning my efficiency and comparing her younger self to me, claiming she'd have accomplished tasks twice as fast. Pick up the pace. Do you think this lethargic attitude will keep our customers happy? If we run short on side dishes today, you'll face the consequences. Yet, the face she presented to the world was completely different. Outside, she was the epitome of kindness, always wearing a warm smile and often involved in charitable deeds. I'd heard from my introducer that they'd first met during a volunteer event for the differently abled. In public, my mother-in-law portrayed me in glowing terms, my daughter-in-law. She's exceptional and incredibly dedicated. She'd regale customers with tales of my commitment, she insists on being in the kitchen to ensure everything is perfect. She works tirelessly, barely stepping out. I genuinely worry for her well-being. Yet, the moment the patrons left, her demeanor would shift dramatically. Stop dawdling and get back to work. The stew you made was subpar. Do you enjoy making a fool of me? Her scolding was relentless. It didn't take long for me to see through her two-faced behavior. The ideals of family she'd sold me on were nothing more than manipulative tactics. The dream of belonging, of having a family, kept me rooted there, despite the harsh reality. My fear of breaking apart the family structure and appearing selfish held me back. My husband was no better, dancing to his mother's every whim. He lacked individual agency, always adhering to her instructions. Stay put and stick to these jobs. Why tire yourself? I've provided everything. You're my son, after all. And he'd comply without question. For two long years, I was ensnared in that restaurant's kitchen, endlessly working. Thoughts of escape often plagued my mind, but my yearning for family always outweighed those fleeting moments. While I remained trapped, my mother-in-law and husband frequently took city trips, indulging in their whims. She'd vacation with her pals, and he'd squander money in frivolous outings with friends. I clung to a faint hope that perhaps, with the birth of a child, their attitudes might change. The revelation from the kitchen maid shattered my world. Brooklyn, were you aware that your husband was infertile before you got married? Surely, given how long you've been here, you knew and still chose to marry him. How did you land yourself in such a situation? Hearing that, something inside me snapped. I left the restaurant in haste, headed home, packed my essentials, and fled. My mother-in-law was on one of her trips, and my husband was out with his friends. Acting purely on instinct, I boarded an express bus, letting it transport me wherever it led. When I alighted, I found myself back in the city I once called home, standing in front of my grandmother's restaurant. Brooklyn, is that you? How did you end up here? And where's your husband? You look so drained. 
Unable to muster a response, tears streamed down my face. Sensing my distress, my grandmother refrained from pressing further. Instead of taking me to the old room above the restaurant where I used to stay, she led me to her home. There, she prepared a hearty meal for me and insisted I eat. She made the bed with the softest blankets and urged me to rest. For the first time in two years, I experienced the peace of undisturbed sleep. After recuperating for a few days, I began assisting my grandmother in her restaurant. One day, she broached a proposition, I've often considered expanding the business, but hesitated given my age. With you by my side, I believe it's possible. Would you be willing to partner with me in this venture? Gratefully, I replied, I'll do anything to support you. You took me in when I was lost. She gently responded, don't speak like that. Remember, I too grew up without parents. When I look at you, I see a reflection of my younger self. Although I tried to remain detached initially, your presence has made it easier to let down my guard. After losing my son, I felt a void and built walls around myself. Yet, lonely souls can find solace in each other. Grandma, your words mean everything to me. I clung to her, overcome with the pent-up emotions from the years of torment at the hands of my in-laws. My grandmother took the next step and formally adopted me, solidifying our bond as family. Even when my husband and mother-in-law sought me out, she stood resolute by my side. Brooklyn now has a family, she is not an orphan anymore. She has legally become my granddaughter. I will not let her return to a household where she's treated no better than a servant. Before I take legal action, I suggest you finalize the divorce and discuss alimony. Taken aback, my husband retorted, what alimony? All we have is our family business. And what evidence do you hold? The one who fled, whether she's your granddaughter or just an orphan, can have her divorce. But don't expect anything else. And with that, they departed. I left behind my bank book and any claim to their assets. But the liberation from that oppressive environment was priceless. My grandmother then surprised me with her plans. She secured a location in a bustling food alley near a prominent corporate hub. After some refurbishments, we launched our own eatery. Turns out, she had a substantial nest egg saved up and our new venture was far grander than her previous establishment. Fueled by the hardships I had endured, I threw myself into our business. Partnering with my grandmother was invigorating, not exhausting. My primary focus was to curate a menu tailored to the tastes of female professionals. I introduced innovative dishes targeting the preferences of young professionals. As expected, these creations swiftly gained traction. Our customer base expanded organically through word of mouth, leading to an influx of patrons even during late hours. Recognizing an opportunity, we ventured into launching a new gourmet outpost focused on chicken and beef recipes. I believe that infusing a touch of professionalism would elevate our brand. Our strategic expansion led to two more outlets in diverse locales, both of which enjoyed immense success. The demand for franchising, particularly our signature chicken dishes, soared, and we facilitated the opening of multiple franchises. My grandmother credited our success to me, showering me with gratitude. Brooklyn, it's your vision and hard work that's brought us here. Who would have thought I'd be the proprietor of multiple thriving restaurants? You deserve to helm our chicken-centric restaurant. But I countered, with you by my side, Grandma, I've accomplished so much. These recipes are the fruits of our combined efforts. The leadership should be yours. Nevertheless, she persisted, and I eventually took the reins of our chicken restaurant. The pride of building a flourishing business from scratch was overwhelming. With newfound stability, I felt compelled to give back to those in challenging circumstances. Recollecting my past visits, I approached a homeless shelter. To my surprise, I ran into my former boss's wife. Her face lit up upon seeing me, Brooklyn. Look at you, a successful restaurateur. 
how wonderful. She proposed a partnership, aiming to cater for a foundation supporting individuals with disabilities. As our charitable initiatives expanded, our self-made meals couldn't keep up with the demand. Hence, we've collaborated with various eateries to cater for us. Rest assured, we'll compensate fairly. You're aware I don't haggle over such matters, right? I sealed the deal with her, promising direct food delivery to the NGO on their next volunteer day. As the date approached, I piloted the food truck to the organization, only to spot a familiar face. It was my former mother-in-law. I had a hunch we might cross paths, given that the lady who connected us previously mentioned she often volunteers here. In an orchestrated manner, she hovered beside the chairperson's wife, projecting the demeanor of a saint. Recognizing the chairperson's wife, my ex-mother-in-law's complexion drained, and her eyes widened in disbelief. Hold on, didn't Samuel mention he was previously wed to Brooklyn? I couldn't recall, as I wasn't present at their nuptials. That's right, Mrs. Thompson, I responded calmly, I was indeed Samuel's wife, and she, pointing towards my ex-mother-in-law, is my former mother-in-law. The revelation caught both women off guard, eliciting mutual stares of astonishment. Without missing a beat, my ex-mother-in-law motioned me aside, pleading in hushed tones, Brooklyn, can we converse privately? There are certain matters best discussed in confidence. Perplexed, I retorted, what could possibly necessitate such discretion? Caught in our exchange, Mrs. Thompson looked on, attempting to piece together our connection. Surely, your compassion isn't just a facade for this establishment. Why wasn't this kindness extended when you confined me to your kitchen, practically holding me captive for two years? She feigned innocence, when did I ever do such a thing? You were family, I only allowed you to contribute as best you could. Is this how families operate? Having one member tirelessly toil away while the others frivolously gallivant and squander the earnings? I single-handedly turned around your sinking restaurant, but you took all the accolades and wasted the profits. You speak of a family, yet where was my compensation for endless work hours without a break? Is the label of a family a carte blanche for you to exploit and oppress me? My revelation seemed to perturb Mrs. Thompson, and her gaze towards my former mother-in-law shifted from confusion to sheer disappointment. Onlookers, too, started murmuring among themselves, sensing the underlying tension. Left with no choice, my ex-mother-in-law, realizing her facade was unraveling, took a desperate plea. Please, I genuinely regret my actions. Yes, it's in the past, but how long will you harbor these grievances? Do you understand the gravity of your betrayal? You never mentioned that Samuel was infertile. While I slaved away, both of you indulged yourselves. You portrayed kindness in the presence of customers, but the mask would slip away once they left. You accuse me of dwelling on the past, but the wounds are still fresh and real. Mrs. Thompson's expression shifted to one of disdain as she processed my words. Turning away from my ex-mother-in-law, her look said it all. My ex-mother-in-law, sensing the potential fallout with Mrs. Thompson, implored, Mrs. Thompson, please understand. It's a miscommunication. You cannot revoke the contract we have for your company's canteen. I urge you to reconsider. But Mrs. Thompson, visibly infuriated, retorted, how could you mislead me under the guise of benevolence? You know what I can't stand. Deception. Deception has its consequences, I remarked, watching as my ex-mother-in-law tried in vain to appeal to my sympathies. She knelt before me, her once domineering demeanor replaced by desperation. Brooklyn, I beg you, help us. If our contract is lost, we'll be buried in debt. Please, just this once. But I couldn't find a shred of sympathy for her. Why would I help you? This is the result of your actions. It's poetic justice. I turned my back on her, leaving her in her state of despair. The atmosphere was thick with tension, but I felt an immense weight lifted off my shoulders. 
Later, they approached me on several occasions, both my ex-mother-in-law and ex-husband, pleading for forgiveness and a second chance. They hoped that I might intervene with Mrs. Thompson on their behalf. But each time, my grandmother and I turned them away, not willing to waste another breath on them. I eventually learned that their restaurant lost the opportunity to serve the company cafeteria. Having taken loans to purchase ingredients and hire staff, their finances crumbled, leaving them in a pit of debt. When I heard they had to abandon their restaurant and flee the city, I felt no remorse. After all, they had exploited my vulnerability and lack of family ties, coercing me to resurrect their dying business, all while providing me nothing in return. It was only fitting that their deception came back to haunt them. Years passed without any word from them. Eventually, I found love again and remarried. Tragically, my beloved adoptive grandmother passed away. My husband, daughter, and I mourned her deeply, honoring her memory with a heartfelt funeral. Her absence still leaves a void in my heart, but other than that, our family thrives in happiness, and our restaurants continue to prosper. The unconditional love and support I received from my adoptive grandmother brought healing to my once fractured heart. It made me realize the transformative power of love and kindness. Now, I aspire to carry her legacy forward, hoping to heal and uplift others, to show that a single act of immense love can indeed illuminate even the darkest corners of someone's world. Thank you for watching and listening to my story. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something from it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more stories like this. And don't forget to share your thoughts and feedback in the comments below. See you next time.